Come on and clap for Jesus as you take your seats this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for our worship uh, this morning. And worship is beautiful because it is through worship that it invokes the presence and the power of Jesus Christ. And they sound a lot better than I will ever sound in that invoking. So I'm grateful for all of them and their ability and the gift that the Holy Spirit has given them to really usher in the presence of Jesus Christ uh, this morning. We're going to baptize today, y'all. Yeah. Come on. At an elementary school. Can you believe that? At an elementary school, we're going to baptize. There's, listen, there's nothing uh, too hard for our God. Nothing. Nothing. What's impossible to man is always possible with the Lord. And I'm grateful. And I want to apologize publicly to everybody this morning. I uh, felt like Martha running around trying to make sure this was there and photography and make sure that this is this and tying up loose ends and making sure everybody is this and is the pool, uh, you know, warm enough. I want Allison to, to get on me after service. So let's make sure the temperature is right and we don't want folks to get too cold and <laughs> You know, just make sure everything was good. And I felt the Holy Spirit really convict me in that moment. And to really get back as Mary was, if you remember that story, just to lay at the feet of Jesus Christ and let him take care of the rest. So I, I got to be quick this morning because uh, we got a lot of people uh, being baptized. And I believe in maybe uh, the Lord God himself will, will prick somebody's heart. And we'll baptize a little. You might not have clothes. Get in your jeans and T-shirt. And we'll still baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This is a special day for me. It really is. And I am pressed for time because I really want us to go out and worship through uh, song and baptism uh, in the bus parking lot here very shortly. But this is a special uh, moment in history. This day, uh, 13 years ago, changed my life. And not many of uh, you know, but I was adopted a second time. I'm um, I am a byproduct, uh, very shortly, of the foster care system. And as a baby, uh, I was adopted, and I'm 39 years of age even today, and I still don't have a knowledge of who my biological parents are, but God uh, pricked uh, the heart of a, of a woman named Phyllis and a man named Thurman to, to see something in me and to call me their child and to bring me in uh, into their family and to take care of me financially and to love me and to, and to just call me uh, their son. And uh, in 2009, in a very, very tiny building, if me and Ernest, Ernest was that really good looking guy that can sing standing over here with the blazer, but if me and him were to put our arms together from fingertip to fingertip, that would have been the size of the building uh, that I was saved in and filled with God's spirit. And in 2009, on this same Sunday, is when God came into my heart. He turned my world, listen to me, he turned my world upside down and he set a fire ablaze in my feet that the devil has not been able to put out. He's, he's tried. He's like the, th like the three, but he, he can't put that flame out. He can't. And the stronger as he blows and the more that he blows, the harder I chase the name of Jesus Christ in his face. And I've been running for the Lord ever since. And my prayer all this week and even last month leading up until this day, Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate the resurrected King, my only prayer is that Jesus Christ will let somebody else have that same encounter. To let somebody know that that same out-of-body experience that I experienced with the Lord through salvation and through the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not only for me, but for anybody who would believe. That I'm desperate, desperately believing that somebody else will run into Jesus the same way that I ran into him because my life has not been the same ever since. And I want you to be excited today 
as we celebrate new life and even through baptism. And we know uh, biblically that the baptism isn't what saves you, but the baptism again is the outward showing of the inward change that's already taken place in the inside of a man or a woman's heart. It's the way that we get to celebrate outwardly of the life of a work that only Jesus and a surgery that only the Lord could perform. That Jesus is such a surgeon that he doesn't need a knife, <laughs> no blood, no scar, but how he can just enter into a man and a woman's heart just like that and turn the world and their life upside down and change the trajectory of their life for the greater good. Why would we not, as Greta ministered here earlier, why would we not celebrate a God like ours? Why? Because he's been that good. And this has been prophesied even from the Old Testament. And it was even from the mouth of Isaiah. If you remember, Isaiah said in the ninth chapter and in the sixth verse, he's an Old Testament major prophet. And I believe God's spirit used him in a very unique way because the way that he was able to exegetically explain the coming of the Christos, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one was really like no other. And in chapter 9, verse 6 in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah says that there will be a child that will be born unto us and a son that shall be given, and the very government will be placed upon his shoulders. His name shall be called a wonderful counselor, Father everlasting, God almighty, the Prince of Peace. And ever since then, the world has been shaken by the coming of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and now he's born of a virgin. He's born of a woman. And he comes to birth and he comes to light and there's an all points bulletin that's put out on the head of Jesus. They, they, they want his life and there's, there's rumors about this coming Christ and how he's uh, going to be the king and how he's going to be uh, the savior, how he's going to, to change the world and change people's lives and it's causing stir and uproar, uproar in the land. And now we see as he gets older, uh, John the Baptist almost becomes like the Michael or Bruce Buffer. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. <laughs> And John the Baptist in a Bruce Buffer type way begins to announce the coming of Jesus Christ coming out of the wilderness. And he says that it's, it's not me, so don't bow at me and, you know, don't place a lot of faith and adoration in me. But the one now, now, now get this, the one that's coming after me now, he's the one that needs to be celebrated. Because when he comes, he's going to do things a little bit different. He, his, his sandals, I'm not even worthy to bow down and to tie the straps that are loosening, and, and, and I'm not even worthy to be baptized by him, but he is coming right behind me. He is known as the Messiah, and when he opens up his mouth, he's preaching a message that's a little bit different, and it's the message of repentance. And this message of repentance is not so much uh, one part of a changed mind, but it's, it's another in a changed lifestyle. It's understanding that to, to, to really have true uh, repentance, and that word in the Greek, matania, it begins in the mind, but it manifests outwardly in a change in our behavior. And the message that we're hearing in contemporary Christianity that's starting to really get on my last nerves is the fact that we can have mind change, but our behavior doesn't have to change. To understand that even basic psychology not associated with the 66 books of the Bible lets us know that even with a mind change, behavior change has to take place. And he says that when he comes, he's, he's going to do some miraculous things. I'm not worthy to baptize him, but if I don't baptize him, I will not fulfill the will of the one who sent the one that came after me. And now through his baptism in the River Jordan, we see uh, that, that he's now submerged in the water. He's brought back to life. The Bible says that even heaven opens and it's God the Father that says that I'm well pleased in the very deeds and the behavior of my son. And this is exciting. And then Jesus goes on and continues to live a life without wrinkle, without spot, and without blemish. He is the perfect spotless lamb that was prophesied under the Old Testament dispensation that he would come not only to remove the stain of sin, but he would actually go down to hell and begin to shake the keys and put a sting into death and bring life to everyone that would believe. Y'all pray for me. I'm, a, I'm trying not to run around this gym this morning. 
And he'll come down the hill and preach a little bit. And when he come up, there's been an account even in one of the synoptic gospels that even dead folks that came out the grave and began to walk around on earth. That he started to do some things and say some things and he began to give sight to the blind and he allowed the deaf to be able to hear the mute could talk, the lame could walk. He began to expel demons. <laughs> he, began to he, he began to be around those who were still baptizing. He selected the disciples and he selected folks and he performed miracles and raised Lazarus and he went to go see Jairus and Zacchaeus had an encounter on a sycamore tree. We see the man being lowered and the roof being torn off and he's being laid down in the presence of Jesus Christ. Jesus getting off the boat in Samaria, going over to Galilee. He's doing some amazing things. And then eventually, a moment, a point in time in history, Jesus sits down the disciples and he lets them know that it was cool that I was able to walk with you for a little while, but here shortly I'm going to be put to death. And I can tell just by the reading uh, some of the Gospels and their accounts that they weren't prepared for the death of Jesus. And I can't blame them. I mean, walking around with Jesus 24-7, that had to be pretty cool. That's him calling right now. <laughs> it had to be, uh, just had to be awesome. And Jesus sits them down and lets them know, listen, you thought it was cool that I could walk with you. Wait till I go back and take my rightful place on the throne because once I leave, I'm going to live inside of you. And now he, he's talking about being put to death. And I believe even in this moment, in the time under the New Testament, they, they, they still are not really getting a grasp and a sense of, of, of appreciation of the words that are coming out of the mouth of Christ. And we know he's, he's now being put to trial. He, he sits them down and he continues to teach them over and over. And he teaches and still even prior to his death, there's teaching and demonstration of power, which is another subject for another day. Uh, but he's teaching and he's got demonstration after he teaches. And we know he's put before trial four different times. He's got two Jewish and two Roman, one before Ananias and uh, one before uh, uh, Cephas. And then he goes twice uh, before Pontius Pilate uh, for Roman trial two times. And now he's made to, to, to carry his cross on, a, on the place of skull, translated on the heel of Golgotha. And I look at Jesus and him having to carry his cross and as God is my witness, mark my words, I believe this is one of the greatest biblical representations of Jesus gently tapping us on the shoulder this morning for those sitting in this gym and watching this message online that if the son of the living God had to carry a cross, you better believe there's going to come a point in time where you're going to have to carry one for yourself. And now he's carrying his cross and they're preparing to crucify him and put him to shame. They're getting him ready to place him between two thieves. And now he's being laid out on the wood. And the Bible lets us know that he's going to be hung high and stretched wide. And they're taking the nails now and beginning to drive them. Imagine that into flesh. And they're beating these nails into his hands and to his feet. And they're placing him to be raised up, to be made a public, a public spectacle of. They put a sign above his head, King of Jews. They make fun of him. If you are the son of God, then get yourself down off of this cross. And now he's got some of his closest disciples and his loved ones right here experiencing the death moment. And they're nailing and not even taking in consideration that the night before they beat him all night. The Bible says that he was beaten almost unrecognizably. Swollen, I can imagine, Eyes probably swole shut, mouth beaten, the crown of thorns shoved into the brow of his head, probably without food and without limited water, making fun of him, but he still had a mission in mind because he was thinking about us when he was on the way to the cross. And now at this point of death, there's something about death, and I'm almost done, but there's something amazing about death. If you've ever been to somebody's funeral that you love and that you respect and that you revere and hold with high regard, it's something about being at a funeral that, that, that the power of death oftentimes is just as powerful as life. That death has the same ability to speak just as much as life speaks. 
that you can be in a room with someone that you love and when you stand over the casket, it just does something to you. It's almost being able to grab a hold of every emotion and you can touch it. It's, it's almost tangible, so to speak. And I believe these same emotions and feelings were going on when, when, when Joseph and Mary and even some of the disciples began to witness the death of Jesus. And even right here in history, we see in the moment that Jesus now, he yields up the spirit, Matthew 27 and 50, according to Matthew's account, he gives up the ghost and he yields the spirit up. And it's at this moment at his death that I believe the disciples begin to doubt like they've never doubted before. Wait a minute, what's going on? What's going on? He's dead. He's not moving anymore. What happened to him walking with us? What happened to the promises? I enjoyed being on the mountain. I enjoyed sailing across the sea. I I can remember, you know, to decide, you know how you reflect when people die. Remember, remember the time when, when we were on the sea running our mouth and <laughs> we wanted Jesus to wake up and he was down there sleeping and snoring and he just got up and came and spoke to the ocean and told it to, to hush and be still. Y'all remember that? It's like going, you do that when people die. Remember when my mama, she used to cook the best fried chicken and she did that and we start recollecting. And I believe they started to do the same thing, but doubt began to creep in. And now uh, that we see uh, the death and the, the, the loudness of what death can actually speak, I believe is the moment in time and in history where everything changes. That this is what I like to call the greatest exchange ever known to all of humanity. Because now we have, listen to this, now we have a perfect savior who is going to get off of his throne, come off of the seat of the throne room of glory, and come down and tabernacle with his own creation and in exchange give up his throne for the crucified cross. There's an exchange. And one of the greatest exchanges, and I thank God for that exchange, something special about that. Who would give up their throne to come and die for me? Jesus Christ. And just like in the Old Testament, you see uh, prophets refer to Moses and the Red Sea as a point of reference that points to the hand of deliverance. And we see the same thing with the New Testament apostles that always point to the cross as a point of biblical reference. And I want you to never forget the cross when you leave this gym this morning. So many uh, of churches I see in contemporary Christianity amongst American sanctuaries are trying to diminish the work of cross of the cross. Satan, I believe, one of his greatest means why he has authority for a limited season on earth is to diminish the perfect work on the cross. Because even Satan knows, I believe, that, that if he can diminish the work of the cross, then he can negate the power of Jesus Christ. That is, the cross is where we, where we pull our strength from. It's the cross that should remind us when times get tough to remind it was real tough for the Savior. It's the cross that, that listen, it, it's one thing to hang one around your neck, but it's another to carry it for yourself. It's easy to hang them in our houses, but it's sometimes difficult to carry. We can get them tattooed on our bodies and put them on bumper stickers on our automobiles, but we're living in a time as Jesus is continuing, as I've said many Sundays now and many podcasts and many videos, as Jesus continues to shake the church, that we need to be reminded of the cross. That if you walk out of this gym, let me tell you, you're sitting in this gym right now and you're not, you don't feel loved, you, you, you feel worthlessness, you feel anxiety, you feel, you're full of fear, then you need to look at the cross. Because the cross to me in my biblical studied opinion is the greatest representation of love in its greatest form. If, you walk, if you're sitting in here and you're feeling like you are nobody, you got to look at Jesus. Because he had to think, come on somebody, he had to think that you had to be somebody because look how far he went to pay the price for you and I. You got to be a somebody. Why would he go that far? Why would the father allow him to be crucified and to be the example for all of humanity? The cross of Jesus Christ. And even when we see in the Holy Communion, Jesus says, listen, as often as you eat, of my, uh, 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 eat this bread and eat of my body and take of my flesh and drink this blood, 
as often as you do this, you do this showing the Lord's death until he comes. As often as you do this, you do this into the remembrance of me. Into the remembrance of me. I'm going to say it again. Jesus said, as often as you do this, not only do you show the Lord's death until he comes, he's coming back for us. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. But when you do this unto me, unto my death, get this, you do it in remembrance of me. When you feel like giving up, when life is tough, he said, remember me. <laughs> when your marriage is hanging by a thread, even though you paint a different picture on social media, but Jesus knows what it's really, what's really going on behind closed doors, he says, remember me. Even if your job lets you go and you get fired, Jesus says, remember me. Even when you don't feel, out, feel like getting out of the bed tomorrow morning, Jesus says, remember me. Even if your children aren't serving the Lord or in a place where you know they ought to be, it's all right. Jesus says, remember me. Even if your money start acting funny and you don't have two nickels to put together to make a dime, Jesus says, remember me. Remember me. When you don't feel like doing life anymore, remember me. When you want to get up and the burdens of life are just too much to bear, Jesus says, remember me. Remember me. <laughs> don't forget, but remember me. Remember me. And now we see in Romans chapter 6, verse 5, and I'm just going to read two verses. Paul says, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, we've been united with Christ in his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Which means Jesus has died and come back to life so we could live a new life. And I ain't talking about a list of New Year's resolutions that most of us can't keep in the flesh anyhow, or us trying to break some bad habit in our flesh that we don't have the power or the ability to do so. I'm not talking about the tearing down of an old house and then bringing in experts to, to refab it and to do it all up, but I'm talking about, Paul is saying, I'm talking about a God who wants to destroy the very works of everything going on in your life to remove the foundation and give you an entirely new life. To lay down your dead man and to put down dead works so you can live again. To understand that if Jesus was the total example of what it meant to be dead and to come back to life, that you too have to come to a point in your life where you are willing to die for the cause of Jesus Christ. To be excited to know that not only are my old, Paul says in the current letter that behold all things have passed away. Which means Jesus has put to death through the power of the Holy Spirit my old man. And now by faith Jesus can reach down in my grave and take out Lazarus and put your name in the blank. And whatever your name is this morning, Jesus is saying through Paul that if we can unite in his death, then it's the same Savior that can reach down with a loving arm and pull you out of the grave. And then now I can experience a new life. I can walk different and talk different, think different, love different, see different, move different. Why? Because I'm different. And then Paul says here lastly in verse 6, knowing that this, that our old man was crucified with him. Crucified with him, put to death, Paul says, that the body of sin might be done away with and that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he, verse 7, who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ and we believe that we shall also live with him. Come on and stand to your feet this morning. That's the power of today. To experience resurrection and that resurrection power in our own life. And I want every person in here to remember what Jesus Christ has done. That this has got to be bigger 
than an animal that can't do what we say it can do because I'm a country boy and I've never seen a rabbit lay an egg. It's got to be bigger than that. It's got to be bigger than the Easter outfits and the nice dresses and the cute shoes. It's got to be bigger than that. There's nothing wrong with looking nice. But it's got to be more to this than that. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be more than the, the hiding of eggs and the, and the good cookouts, the ribs on the grill, and the deviled eggs, the stuff that I love. Pray for me. <laughs> but this day is to celebrate the resurrected Christ. And because he was resurrected, Paul says, we too can experience new life. And my prayer, again, as I said earlier this morning, is that you would run smack dab into Jesus Christ. It's to understand that encounter is not just subject to me, but to any man or woman or child that will believe on the perfect atoning work of what took place as Christ carried his own cross to be crucified, put to death, and to be resurrected back to life. That's powerful, y'all. And I don't want us to ever forget that. Remember Jesus Christ, because I'm telling you, it's hard to prepare for life sometimes. Life, life deals us blows oftentimes that we're not prepared to be delivered. We're just not we're not prepared for the diagnosis that the doctor gives us. We're not prepared to lay a loved one down and, and watch their casket and watch them be put to death. The government's, I mean, the government's acting funny. Listen, I don't care. I don't care who gets in office and Trump can come back for a second term. It won't mean anything. Government will only get worse. I'm prophesying. Government will only get worse. Government will only, it won't matter who sits in that throne, but you need to remember who sits in the throne. And you might not like that type of preaching, but that's okay because it's Bible. And your confidence can't be put in a government that's full of sinful men and sinful women. You, think the, you thought the government shut down four years ago, we ain't seen anything yet. God showed me one time, just here shortly, that the next time the government shut down, it's going to get our attention like it's never gotten our attention before. We'll talk about it next Sunday. The next time it shuts down, it's going to get, it's going to get everybody's attention, the church included. And all those that say they love Christ, their bluff's going to be called. And we're going to see who really stands for Christ and who's willing to die. Mark my words. But the hope and confidence that should rest in every man and woman's heart in this room today is that the resurrected Jesus lives inside of you. And regardless of what happens in this earth dispensationally, it doesn't matter because your name has been etched in the Lamb's Book of Life.